Hello. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, welcome to, uh, great, good to know. <laughs> yeah, welcome to uh, More Than Maps. Uh, so we've got an uh, introduction to, um, to Google Earth Engine today um, you, for environmental mapping. So uh, welcome. And um, once I find my mouse. Um, just to give you a quick introduction, I know not everyone's uh, used Zoom before, so just a few key features. We've got um, your mute and camera at the bottom, and um, between share screen and end, you might have a more button, or if you've got a wider screen, you might see all the features, but there's some uh, uh, sort of reactions and uh, emojis and stuff there, which you can send. And um, yeah, so uh, there's also a chat. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat and talk to us and uh, interact and let us know how you're getting on and things like that. So please do use it. Um, cool. So just before we start, just so we'd really like to know what you're expecting from this workshop and where you're at. So we've got a very, very quick two question survey for you to do. So you can either scan the QR code that's up on the screen or in the chat, uh, Daniela will pop a, um, a link to, to the survey. So I'll give you just a minute to do that. And um, also, if you'd like a certificate of participation from this workshop, you can um, drop Seen an email, her emails on there. So you can just um, say so that you'd really like a certificate and uh, she'll send one to you. Um, it might be a bit handy to show that you've uh, done some work with Google Earth Engine. So I'll give you a few more seconds to do the couple of questions. Okay, while you are probably doing that in the background, I'll uh, start by introducing myself. So uh, my name's Yana. I'm a PhD student at Southampton University, and uh, I do a lot of uh, remote sensing, uh, which if, uh, I mean, I don't know who we've got here, but if it's a new word to you, we'll find out what it is today. And um, so I do lots of environmental monitoring and environmental mapping, and um, I mostly uh, look at sargass and seaweed, which we'll also learn about today. And um, yeah, and, and Daniela, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Jana. Um, yeah, I'm, by the way, in the corner, um, Daniela Rivera Marin, the most Spanish name you probably will hear. It. And I'm also in, in the remote sensing area, but studying desert, so the other way on the coast. Thanks, Daniela. So we've got the rest of the team up there. So um, we're More Than Maps is a project uh, that's a public engagement project, and the idea is that uh, we like to share skills and information related to climatic hazards and uh, sort of transfer and um, sort of uh, let you know about all the research uh, that we do and uh, yeah, like I say, share, share some skills. So this project um, is made up of PhD students like ourselves and um, then there's, and uh, Marie is also another PhD student and then we've got our professors Jadu and Emma and Jack um, who all have different specialisms. So um, Climate, climate adaptation and policy making and things like that. And then we've got our postdocs who are Vicky and Seen. So we're quite a good, uh, quite a good team. And um, fortunately not all of us could be here today, but uh, you should be in good hands <laughs> with me and Daniela. So uh, now that we've introduced ourselves to you, it'd be really nice if we could uh, get to know you guys a little bit. So uh, there's an icebreaker there. Uh, Daniela will pop the link in the chat. I know not everyone uh, has microphones or wants to speak and things. So this is um, a great exercise uh, where we use uh, Google uh, Jamboards. So uh, if I share it. You should look at a screen like this and on the side down the left here, you should be able to add a sticky note or, or a text box, whatever you prefer. And if you can just let us know your name, uh, if you're with a company or uh, or not, or just uh, maybe just some uh, information about yourself and um, a hazard you'd like to learn more about.
point on that. <laughs> Disappeared, but I did do it. <laughs> so hopefully that's not happened to anyone else. Um, Nice, we've got a few of you interested in extreme weather. Anything, I like it. <laughs> Hopefully this workshop uh, will be great for you guys. So we've actually got um, three sort of choices uh, as we go through the workshop. Um, we get to choose what uh, what you uh, do do the activity in Google Earth Engine on. So we've got three different topics. Um, so hopefully uh, they'll be able to tick all your boxes. Flooding, nice. We don't have um, well, uh, we don't have a flooding option today, but we do have other workshops specifically on flooding. So if you're interested in flooding, definitely have a look out for our other workshops that come up. Uh, one of them is also on uh, Google Earth Engine related to flooding. So um, yeah. Great. OK, well, it's really nice to meet you all. I'm going to crack on um, with with the rest of the presentation. So just to give you an idea of what we're doing today, hopefully by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to have a, a, a understanding of seaweed blooms as a case study for climate change adaptation. Uh, you'll know a bit more about remote sensing and monitoring environmental change and be able to navigate around the Google Earth platform and uh, have uh, developed some code and um, be able to do, detect change over time uh, with, with your code. So we visualize in data, applying detection algorithms, and yeah, so it should be really good. So uh, just as a guide, uh, might might be a, a few minutes off here and there, but uh, we'll have we will sort of finish the introduction now. About to go on to Sargas and uh, case study, and then remote sensing basics, and then we'll have a quick break, and uh, we'll get on to uh, Google Earth Engine stuff. So, if you have any questions at any time, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom or ask in the chat. Uh, Daniela will be keeping an eye on the chat and answering all your questions. So, please, if you're lost or you want me to clarify something, please just drop a message in the chat at, or raise your hand. We, we encourage mics and if you want to talk to us. And yeah, um, yeah, please, please don't uh, sit there worrying. Uh, definitely talk to us. Okay, so a bit about sargassum. So when we think of a natural hazard, uh, we often think of really big events like uh, volcanoes, or um, floods or earthquakes. And we don't often think about other events, but uh, the definition of a natural hazard, uh, which is up there from the UN, is an uh, event that may cause loss of life, injury, health impacts, property damage, loss of livelihoods, loss of services, social economic disruption, or environmental damage. That's a really broad uh, description. And like I say, when we, think, when we think of those sorts of things, we often jump to really big sort of notable events. Event. But actually there are some smaller changes going on uh, in our world at the moment. And uh, one of those um, is sargassum. So sargassum is a, a type of brown seaweed. There's over 300 different species of sargassum found globally. And there's uh, two species, which are sargassum natans and sargassum fluitans, which are always floating. So they never grow roots or hold fast and they never grow uh, in seabeds. They spend their entire lives floating and they have these little gas bladders which enable them to float all the time. And it's these two species um, that are, uh, that are uh, what, what I study. And um, so they're a type of macroalgae and uh, they're found, um, they were originally from the Sargasso Sea, which is an area of uh, the tropical, uh, well, just the Atlantic, North Atlantic uh, around here. And um, in uh, the last few years, they've escaped out of that, that system. And they're now found in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Caribbean, and the whole way across the tropical Atlantic um, to West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea. 
So um, what we used to see before 2011 was individual clumps, small bits washing up on beaches, but now what we're seeing uh, is uh, on the right side, we're seeing these massive amounts, which you can see these uh, floating, floating bits, um, floating mats rafts uh, get um, deposited on the beaches. And um, so this is a, um, a key environmental change, which uh, is effect, impacting communities uh, in those environments. So a quick question for you guys. Um, what do you think might be causing this change? You can pop it in the chat. And Danielle, if you could read out the answers that come through, that'd be great. So yeah, just thoughts on what might have caused this change. Newton runoff, warming waters, bleaching. Amazing, yeah, perfect answers. I think we've got. Um, so yeah, wait, absolutely. Wait, 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 wait. There's one more. Oh, there's more. Increased there's more. Amazing. Increased temperature of the water. Increasing temperature of water. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so is there, are there more? Are we good? I think we're good. At least someone else is speaking now. <laughs> no, Great. Yeah, so really good, really, really good. So we actually don't know the definitive answer for um, why we're getting uh, these blooms, but um, there's uh, been lots of thought that um, they were they were initially moved out of the Sargasso Sea by um, a really strong North Atlantic oscillation, so an oceanic event in 2010, and um, they've been sustained by fertilizers entering the system and um, other atmospheric events like um, Saharan dust storms, which again act as a fertilizer and um, seasonal wind patterns allowing them to aggregate on, on the water surface and move to different parts of the ocean and yet yeah, warming and climate change. So um, what we have here is a uh, Rockstrom's planetary boundaries. And um, the general idea is uh, that um, we have changes that happen uh, happen on the Earth's surface and, um, or perhaps in the atmosphere, and um, these uh, these changes, um, you know, they they reach a point and then they create change. So if we look at say nitrogen and phosphorus, we're um, beyond the zone of of uncertainty with them. So um, it, that's a that's a global global trend. And um, so yeah, absolutely, all these factors and changes could be causing. Um, causing secondary changes like like these blooms. So yeah, you're all really on the nose with your answers. Um, but well, you know, why, why do we care about sargas and why is it important? Well, it's got lots of environmental, socioeconomic uh, um, impacts. So if we just uh, think of biodiversity, I can I've rambled about diversity for a really long time. So I'll <laughs> try and keep it short. So uh, my favorite example to use is uh, of the impacts uh, is turtles. So um, we have lots of um, different species of turtles living in the tropical Atlantic region. And um, when uh, when there's sargassum that's washed up on the beaches, it can reduce turtle nesting sites. Uh, one study has said by up to 25%. But not only that, when um, if uh, tur turtles' eggs have been, have been laid on the beaches and sargassum is stacked on top of the sand, uh, what can happen is um, that um, uh, that the, the neonate hatchlings have to climb out the sand and then also climb out uh, a load of sargassum. and they get really exhausted, which means they're um, much easier to catch by predators and um, you know, um, they're, they're less likely to make, to make it to the sea. And then the other thing is when there's these rafts um, that are quite close to shore and being deposited, they swim out and they think they've, they're safe. They think they've reached the sanctuary or their home when they reach the rafts and they have their rest, but they don't know that they're then being transported closer back to the coast. So it um, has lots of impacts on them. Sargassum is also a refuge for small fish, crustaceans, things like that. So there's population impacts where um, fish, uh, larger fish have uh, less uh, food supply. So, um, and then obviously sargassum sits on top of, of the ocean like we saw in the other, in the other picture. So it can um, uh, kill other sea grasses and benthic things living underneath as it restricts their access to oxygen and light and things like that. So a whole load of uh, impacts of, on biodiversity. Um, if we uh, move on to socioeconomic examples, so I'll talk about uh, fisheries and aquaculture here. So um, 
And we've got lots of sargassum stacks on the beaches. There's been reports of it being stacked up, you know, three, four meters high on the beaches as it gets accumulated. Um, fishermen can't get their boats out. And when if they do get their boats out, often get their equipment and nets and things often get full of the seaweed and they um, spend a lot of time cleaning, repairing, replacing equipment that um, that means that they're working much longer hours for the same or possibly even uh, less catch and therefore less money, less income. Uh, so yeah, massive impacts on those. And um, briefly touch on tourist industry. So we get um, tourists wanting, you know, pristine beaches and uh, then they get there and there's seaweed on the beaches and um, then they recommend their friends not to camp. So it has that sort of impact. And then we also get, um, uh, get uh, beach activities such as jet skiing not able to go ahead. So um, significant impact on uh, tourist economies there. Despite all those negative things that I've uh, just rambled about, uh, it also presents lots of opportunities. So sargassum can be used for biofuel, a soil fertilizer. Uh, communities are being really creative and resourceful and making construction blocks, plates, all sorts of things out of it. So um, the, 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 the aim of my research is to hopefully support it as sargassum as a view of a, as an opportunity. And the more we know about it, uh, the, more, the more communities can uh, make use of it as a resource. So, which takes me back to what I do and why mapping is useful. So, um, it very much falls in the preparedness part of the disaster risk management cycle. So, if we know where sargassum is, and um, we have, we can detect seasonal trends and patterns. We can be ready to respond to it. So, we can get cleanup crews, and um, we can um, also get. Um, yeah, so we can get we can get cleanup crews. We can have uh, teams ready to respond to to influxes of sargassum, and uh, we can uh, sort of uh, encourage fishermen to uh, fish different times or um, and all these things. So it ultimately contributes to an early warning system for communities. So an example of a of a, this type of uh, hazard mapping uh, is, uh, you know, you might have seen these before, but volcanic risk maps. So here's an example from Nevada del Ruz. And um, you can see here that uh, we've very clearly got where the hazards are, the lava flows, the mud flows, and um, we can plan a bit better. We can uh, say we want the new housing development to be in one of those white spaces where there isn't, uh, it isn't likely to be impacted by a volcano and things like that. So it's very useful for the preparedness stage. Um, so hopefully that's told you a bit about sargassum and um, it, sargassum will be an option for you to map in the Google Earth Engine uh, workshop part later. So, um, so you, now you know a bit about what it is. So um, on to some remote sensing. So just to put remote sensing into context, I just want to start by thinking about global changes generally. I think one of the most notable changes is the world's growing population and the demands that has. If we think about this in the context of the environment, changes in the environment can have impact on communities, for example, on water resources. And we can see that an increased population has higher water demands and can impact water stress levels. Changes like these are more recently compounded by climate change. So if we think about this um, in the context of sargassum, the socioeconomic and ecosystem impacts on affected communities. So environmental changes really matter because of these impacts and they can allow us, and uh, monitoring it, uh, monitoring these changes can allow us to do something about it. So a uh, quick question for you guys. Um, can you come up with uh, an environmental change occurring in your geographic region? As most of you might be UK based, but um, you can think of, uh, another uh, one from anywhere in the world or maybe something you you are interested in daniela do you mind reading from the chat again please more heat waves like with the one we have today hey <laughs> It has been pretty warm. <laughs> cyanobacteria? Oh, cyanobacteria, yeah. Blue. I saw that one pop up. I can't see them all for some reason. But yeah, it's different. Yeah. Predicted rising sea levels, serial coastal erosion, increased rainfall. 
warmer winters. Amazing. I love the, I love these. They're all yeah, perfect examples of environmental changes yeah. happening. Is there more? Regulation and flooding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some of those are really interesting actually. Great. So what we need, uh, so think about what we need to be able to monitor and detect these changes. We need something with global reach, so something that's cost and time effective, and something that will be able to give us information, so data about, about the change. And um, a simple solution to this is using satellites, which collect data regularly and, and tick all of those boxes. So can you think of any other monitoring techniques or maybe a monitoring technique that would um, would be used to monitor the environmental change or could be used to monitor the environmental change you mentioned before. Have we got Daniela? Citizen science. Great. Surveys in the same line. Do we mean uh, surveys like surveying people or surveying the environment? What type of surveys are we thinking? Uh, remote sensing came into the play. Remote sensing, any particular type of remote sensing or equipment you would use? Environmental surveys. Photography, water quality. Great, yeah, really, really good answers there. So yeah, all perfect examples of, of monitoring techniques. Have we got more coming in? No, I think Anna was just answering your question of what type of remote sensing. It was just okay. remote sensing for water quality parameters. Great, perfect, yeah and biological indicators. Great, yeah, <laughs> all, 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 uh, all perfect answers, yeah. So um, thinking about uh, what remote sensing actually is, so it's the science of obtaining information about objects or areas from a distance. So um, the most, um, they're, they're the most commonly used type of data because uh, they're, they're often freely available and sorry I'm talking about satellites now I should have said that satellites are the most commonly used uh, um, uh, form of remote sensing as the data they kept is often freely available and their regular orbit means uh, the data is uh, continuously and regularly collected so um, can you guys think of uh, some other remote sensing platforms other than satellites. GIS. So GIS is uh, more of a tool to process uh, data rather than a uh, method of collecting data. Uh, so it, it would be used as, um, as part of the analysis process rather than the actual collecting data. Unless you talk about RGS Pro, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, drones, uh, data logging, using telemetry. Yeah, absolutely. Drones, telemetry, yeah. Any more coming in? Uh, photo storm planes or helicopters, aerophotography. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So actually, the uh, the first uh, remote sensing images, the first aerial images, were actually taken from hot air balloons. So that's also a form of remote sensing. And um, we've also got things like sonar and radar, uh, lidar, um, all those types of things where you're collecting uh, collecting that data from from a distance. So yeah, great answers. Okay, so uh, just a bit more of the technical stuff now. So the electromagnetic spectrum is uh, the range of frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. So frequency range is uh, divided um, divided into separate bands, and the electromagnetic 
the electromagnetic waves within each frequency band have different names. So uh, if we begin at the low frequency, we've got the long wavelength end of the spectrum, which are radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and increasing uh, wavelength now, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays are at the high uh, frequency end, which is uh, the short wavelength. So the electromagnetic waves in each of these bands have different characteristics, such as how they're produced, how they interact with matter and their practical applications. So um, just thinking about this uh, in, um, in the context of sargassum, let's have a quick question and uh, uh, I think there's a poll we've got ready. So uh, what, what band is Sargassum most distinguishable in, do you think? The near infrared, the short wave infrared, uh, the visible microwave or red edge? I think there should be a poll that you can see, right? Yeah, it's come up for me, so <laughs> maybe it's come up for you guys. We have five people who have responded so far, so yeah, it has. Great. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, have we got a few more answers? What's the... Uh, What's the verdict? Okay, I can see them. Perfect. Okay, we've got visible as as the winner. So um, it was a little bit of a trick question because it was one that I didn't actually mention. So the real answer is the red edge. So you went to your far off uh, with visible and not far off with near infrared either. So the red edge is uh, the edge of uh, the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So at, at that end, we have a uh, red so it's where um red and uh near in infrared uh meet we what we see is a spike in um in reflectance uh, around there great thank you for putting that out and right so we when um when electromagnetic radiation interacts with the Earth's surface, it's reflected and absorbed in and transmitted in different amounts by different surface, surfaces of the Earth. So um, each object has uh, a unique uh, spectral property so that um, they reflect, absorb and transmit different amounts, uh, which gives them their unique spectral signature. So um, what we can see here is a few uh, examples of these signatures. So, for example, um, if we if we take um, if we take soil for for as an example, we can see um, it increases uh, through the visible and tends to increase through the near infrared and um, is very, slightly more variable but still high in reflectance in the short wave infrared. And um, if we take um, healthy vegetation for example, we can see here this increase here. That's the red edge that that I mentioned before, where we've got that. Um, gap between the visible and the near infrared where we see a spike in um in reflectance so um which wavelength where we, which wavelength do you think is good to distinguish between soil and vegetation so if you had uh, an image with both soil and vegetation where whereabouts do you think you'd look so you, you can maybe answer in micrometers so one of the numbers at the bottom suggests where um where you might look to uh, differentiate between between the two Daniela, have we got anything in the chat? Uh, solid two. Solid two, I like it, decisive. Anyone else or are we, are we going with two? Um, another two. Another two. Okay. Well, 
two, I can fully see why you've gone for two, because that, that is a big gap between uh, soil and uh, healthy vegetation. But that, that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for the biggest difference between uh, between the two things. But actually, in this case, we'd actually use uh, this gap here. So we'd go for uh, between uh, 0 0.8 and uh, 1. And uh, that's, that's because... Um, Water can really, presence of water in the soil can, can really impact the spectral signature around, around the shortwave infrared. So um, it makes it an unreliable point to distinguish. It's more reliable uh, around, around 0 0.8 to 1. But yeah, really good. Can see your thinking in the right way. So um, here we've got um, clear water and uh, algae laden water. So uh, this time it's in uh, nanometers. So uh, anyone want to give a guess about where uh, where we might look here to distinguish between the two? Six eighty. 80, so that's around here. Any other ideas? 550. 550. Yeah, I'd I'd go with 550. I'd look around there because uh, to me that's the that's the biggest distinction there. So um, yeah, there are uh, there are different methods as always to to look at things, but yeah, that's that's where I'd go. But yeah, um, great. So. Um, what we'll be doing today is uh, we'll be measuring greenness uh, in our images and one way to do that is uh, using this uh, index which is uh, the normalized difference vegetation index so um, it gives an it can give an indication like I say of greenness or um, biomass and what it does is it gives us a ratio so we've got near infrared subtract band subtracted by the in red band divided by the near infrared band plus the red band and that gives us a ratio so we get a values between minus one and one so every pixel in, in the image would have a value of minus one to one somewhere in between so um just to work out um which end of that you know it was is is one uh, healthy vegetation or unhealthy vegetation or is it something else so I've got this little table here, which I'll just uh, talk you through so you can hopefully see the sort of maths and thought behind uh, NDVI. So um, if we look at red in the healthy, um, it's lower, it's got lower reflectance um, than um, in the unhealthy. So we'd put low in that box and in the near infrared, it's got high. So the NDVI result should be high for, uh, for healthy vegetation. And when we look at unhealthy vegetation, the Red, um, the red uh, band is um, high in unhealthy and lower in uh, the near infrared and the NDVI should be low. So um, we're looking for values uh, close, closer to one, uh, which indicate greenness and um, vegetation. So uh, that uh, wraps up our um, introduction, introductory sort of um, um, information for, for the next part. So um, we are three minutes ahead of schedule, which is always really nice. Um, but I just want to make sure that everyone has signed up for a Google Earth Engine account. Um, Danielle is just popping uh, the link into the, um, the chat now. But can I just get a hand up if you, if you haven't yet signed up for a Google Earth Engine account, just so I know where we're at? I think it was emailed out to you a few days ago. Um, So yeah, hand up if you haven't managed to do it. Have we got any hands? Sorry, Danielle. Well, two don'ts. <laughs> so two don'ts or two don'ts. Yeah, like done. They done. They okay, did done. <laughs> Great. Okay. Okay, so if you haven't, there's no worries. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, using our quick break now to sign up, that would that would be great. And hopefully the email will come in. Uh, Daniela has popped the link in the chat, I think. Yeah. Yeah, great. So there's instructions on that link uh, for how to do it. If you have any trouble, just let us know in the chat and Daniela will be on hand. Otherwise, uh, we will see you back here. Uh, we'll give you a 12 minute break. So at uh, 10 to, so at 6.50, uh, I assume you're, if you're not in the UK, uh, you might have to do the work it out, but um, I think everyone 
from the initial thing that like they were here. So yeah, 6.50, so it's be about 12 minutes, 11 minutes now, okay? Folks, just before you head off on your break, we've got a wee question in the chat um, about the registration. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see if I can find the chat. Great. So uh, hopefully everyone's uh, back from uh, the break. Uh, and uh, no worries if you're still signing up or um, getting yourself together in the background, uh, because uh, what's coming up next. So just an introduction uh, to Google Earth Engine and JavaScript. So um, Daniela's put a link in the chat, which is uh, the booklet for this part. So um, there's a st some instructions uh, for you to follow along. Don't need to look at it just let yet, but just um, sort of have it ready. Uh, so there's, uh, you can use the QR code on the screen uh, uh, if you prefer. Uh, if you have got a bigger screen than the phone, I do recommend having it on there as I think uh, it might be too small on, on a phone. So um, the link in the chat might be a bit better, um, but entirely up to you. Um, so at the top of that booklet, there's a couple of videos which you, you can watch in your own time. So um, what I'm gonna show you is uh, a video uh, it's a Google Earth Engine sort of original sort of video, a bit about why uh, why Google Earth Engine was developed and, and what for. And um, uh, the video on the booklet is the newer version. So they quite recently came up with an updated video. So I still personally prefer this video. I think it shows uh, what Google Earth Engine is about a bit better. Um, but it is, it is outdated and you'll see that the, the website and the interface uh, isn't quite what we'll see today, but the concept is the same. I'm going to go home, ahead and uh, play that. Ask the average person for the biggest cause of global warming and chances are they won't say trees. But in fact, tropical deforestation, the loss of the healthy forests that absorb carbon dioxide, accounts for more greenhouse gas buildup than all the cars, planes, and other vehicles in the world combined. Today there's a growing consensus in favor of protecting the world's forests. But for these sustainability projects to succeed, tropical nations have to be able to accurately observe and report on the changing state of their forests, often in remote parts of the world. Every day, Earth-orbiting satellites gather incredible amounts of environmental data, but storing oh sorry accidentally clicked no oh, sorry oh. when consensus in favor of protecting the world's forests but for these sustainability projects to succeed tropical nations have to be able to accurately observe and report on the changing state of their forests often in remote parts of the world every day earth orbiting satellites gather incredible amounts of environmental data but storing and publishing this information is an enormous task, and as a result, much of it is never seen by the people who need it most. That's why we built Google Earth Engine. Earth Engine is an online environmental monitoring platform that makes available to the entire world a dynamic digital model of our planet, updated daily. We've started by publishing online for the first time the complete archive of more than 25 years of historical Landsat imagery for the planet's tropical regions. This archive gives dozens of countries access to the most current data about their forests. Earth Engine also gives scientists and officials high performance tools to analyze and interpret detailed environmental data, from rainforest changes in the Amazon to water resources in the Congo. Calculations that used to take hours or days to perform can now be done in minutes or seconds. Earth Engine is also empowering local communities in the developing world. The indigenous Surui tribe in the Brazilian Amazon, for instance, is using satellite imagery in combination with smartphones to monitor and protect their rainforest. Think of Google Earth Engine as an environmental watch program in which everyone can participate. Local citizens, governments, scientists, donors, the media, anyone who's interested in what's happening to the natural world. The work matters. Today's environmental challenges are complex and daunting, and we all have to do our part to meet them. To that end, we'll continue developing this platform, adding more data, more tools, and new applications. We hope that over time, Google Earth Engine will help reduce tropical deforestation, empower developing nations and local communities, and contribute to a more informed understanding of our planet. If you'd like to learn more, please visit us at earthengine.googlelabs.com. We hope you enjoy exploring. Okay, so uh, that was sort of like a, a quick video about it. I can see in the chat that, um, some of you are struggling uh, with the Sway link. Um, 
I, I can only apologize for that. And um, I can try and generate a new link. It worked for the workshop yesterday, so it's, uh, I'm not sure uh, what's going on uh, today, but um, if you bear with me, I can uh, generate a new link. Um, if you think that's helpful, should I do that, Daniela? Yeah, I just overload the one that it opens in my computer, so maybe it's different, maybe not, but. Okay. Um... All right, I'll, I'll generate a, um, a new one just in case, and then uh, Daniela, I'll send uh, I'll send you the link if that's okay, and if you can um, pop it in the chat. I think it's the same one that I just sent. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe. If, try, try, try. Okay, if it's, I can say, suggest refreshing the page. Then, um, if it's the exact same link, try refreshing the page. Because I've double checked the settings, and it should be that anyone, anyone with a link can access it. Everyone's is, is that people saying they're in? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. That's... Great, perfect. Okay. Um, if you're still having any difficulty getting in, uh, my suggestion is um to just refresh the page and and give it another go. I'm sorry about that. That it, um that didn't quite work. I'm not sure what what went on there, but um. If you are still having trouble, just uh, please let us know and we'll see what we can do. OK. Um, so um, what we're doing in, uh, in part the Google Earth Engine part of this, uh, so uh, you should be able to create a repository in new files. So I think you should have already created a repository as part of the, uh, the setup. Um, so hopefully we'll have an int introductory understanding uh, of coding JavaScript and be able to define a variable, assign values to them, use basic math, math functions, use the map object uh, to uh, display uh, our outputs, and uh, be able to use uh, Java-specific uh, syntax and be able to save and run scripts. Um, so we'll be, uh, sorry, like, uh, like I said earlier, we'll be comparing uh, two images uh, over time. And um, uh, Google Earth Engine uh, today will be using the JavaScript uh, platform. Um, so JavaScript is a programming language. So it came about when, um, when uh, so it was developed by a company called Netscape and it came about when uh, the internet was originally, you know, in HTML, and that was sort of black and white, and um, and CSS, which is another language that was introduced, and that came about to introduce color and font and more exciting things uh, into websites. And then JavaScript uh, was developed uh, to add uh, uh, buttons, graphics, animations, and um, it's uh, increasingly uh, used today. So for games. Uh, uh, browser-based games for in apps and in data handling like what we're doing today so it's uh, increasingly popular for for other users so just some key terms that we'll be using today so um just just gave what i mean uh, by a variable so fear of a variable is a container to store data so we we name our own variables so i've put an example there so var is short for variable and in javascript um to let the computer know that you're defining a variable. We put var, name the variable. This can be anything. And uh, equals doesn't literally mean equals. Uh, it um, it uh, means we are assigning uh, data to this variable or storing data. So the, the we use the word uh, assignment uh, um, there. And we've got functions. So a function is a block of code that can be um, referenced again by name. So we might. Um, 
So today we're, we're going to create a function that calculates NDVI. So when we do it for our second image, we don't have to write the whole uh, calculation out again. Uh, we can just call the function uh, by, by its name um, when we do it for our second image. And we've got statements. So uh, statements are um, any combination of variables, functions, and uh, operators. So um, plus, minus, times, divide, keywords, comments, all of these things. Um, Put together so um it's the way we tell uh, the computer form uh perform an action and in javascript we uh separate statements uh with semicolons so at the end of a statement uh, there should always be a semicolon and then we've got arrays so um images are stored as arrays um so if we consider the pixels to each have uh, different values and um they're laid out uh, as as an array as, as like a grid and uh, something to note uh, in JavaScript is uh, the very first um, uh, data point in an array. So if we consider this to be the top left uh, pixel, uh, it's not the first pixel. We give it uh, the index of this uh, value there is zero. So, so something to bear in mind. Uh, won't be too important for today, uh, but different languages uh, often call it one. So yeah, JavaScript uh, calls it zero. So. Um, here are our three options for today. So uh, you can uh, choose um, to, uh, to, to to do the next part, the actual uh, Google Earth engine encoding part and uh, uh, calculating the image change in um, on agriculture. So uh, in Spain this year, there's been a drought. So looking at the effect of that on crop yield and or in Canada in 2017, there was some wildfires. So we kept comparing images from a couple of years before the wildfires and just after. Or there's uh, Sargassum as your option, uh, which is a um, ocean coastal uh, detection one. Well, uh, on the algae blooms of the case study that I was rambling about in the beginning. So um, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes uh, to look through those. Um, that if you're all in this way booklet, you should see them all in there and you'll be able to access those links if you want to have a look at the news articles or articles related for a bit more information. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just be quiet for a couple of minutes and give you a chance to look at those and choose uh, choose which one you want. I've already called them option one, option two and option three going forward uh, just for ease. So agriculture being one, wildfires being two and uh, the algae blooms being three. So yeah. Okay, so hopefully you've all um, chosen which option you'd like and had a chance to read through them a little bit. Um, so if we all want to make sure we've got code editor up, so hopefully you're looking at a screen that looks a little bit like this. So I just point out uh, a few features for you. So we've got the code editor up here. That's where we'll be uh, typing our code. We've got the map object there, and that's where we'll make our outputs appear. Um, we've got uh, geometry tools um, over here, which uh, we won't be using too much today. And we've got Zoom. Uh, a bit of an odd screenshot so actually zoom is a plus and minus button that's no longer a slidey bar 
and got the layer manager, which you won't be able to see yet, but you will be able to see once we start having some outputs. We've got save and run the script up here and the console output here, which will show us any errors or anything we print. So um, if you uh, look in the booklets, there is um, sort of a starter code that I've um, put up there. So if I, uh, let me just get one up. Be. So yeah, this is the Sargassum one, for example. So um, hopefully you're looking at either a screen like this or um, one of the others. So um, just to talk you through, we've got our geometry here under import. So that's this uh, polygon here. So I pre-drawn the polygons for you um, just to make sure there is data on, on the dates that we're searching and that um, it's largely cloud free so we can actually see what's going on uh, on, on, the, on the Earth's surface there. Um, so I've uh, set the map center here. So um, the map should be centered over, over the uh, geometry. So map just uh, tells, um, tells the map object down here what to do. So um, hopefully you're looking at, at, um, at one of those Three, uh, three screens there. So if I just show you the three. So uh, option one, so agriculture uh, sh should look like that. Wildfire should look like that. Algae bloom should look like that. So hopefully you're sort of in the right study area and uh, you're looking at one of those three. So um, if at this stage, if you can save your script, some of you uh, might have the save button a bit grayed out. So it might look like uh, this one here rather than uh, the, this one in the middle. And all you need to do, if you just add a space on a green line, it will let you, uh, it will then let you save. Um, so you just need to essentially edit it. But if you do it on a green line rather than um, uh, any other line, uh, that would be great. So the green lines are comments. So two forward slashes are, um, our comments in, in JavaScript. So it means that these... Um... Oh, Yana, there's Kim. Okay, uh, so in the, that... in, yeah, in the Sway booklets, um, there is uh, links to the code that there that are set up. So if you have a look in, in that booklet, uh, in step one, there will be option one, option two, option three, and there is a link to each of those three codes, which will take you to one of the, sorry, might not explain that clearly. Okay, great. No, no worries. I'll probably jump ahead. <laughs> um, I'll wait for everyone to catch up and uh, give you all a few seconds to make sure you can see one of those. So yeah, um, what was I saying? Yeah, comments. So, uh, Two forward slashes are um, comments, so that means that uh, they won't run. Um, at, it tells the computer to ignore those lines, and it will only run the lines uh, without the two forward, forward slashes um, in front. So you can see the statements on there. So map center object geometry has um, got a semicolon at the end, so that's one statement there. Danielle, is everything okay? Just they want the links to the options. So I'm trying to put the option one, two, and three in oh, the chat. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I see you got it. I'm, I'm gonna hope that means that everyone is uh, sort of there. Uh, so, I'll give you a bit more time to save your script. So like I say, if, if it's grayed out and you can't save it, add a space on a green line and then you should be able to hit, hit that drop down and then hit save as. Uh, Daniela, do you think we can get the poll up to see if everyone's finished that step? Sorry. We've got some, so at the end of, uh, or towards the end of steps, I'll, we'll get a poll up, I think, with the, um, so we know where you're at, because obviously we're doing this online and it's uh, 
it's quite hard to, to gauge where everyone's at without uh, being in like a computer and being able to see. So if you can let us know um, how you're doing, that would be really useful for us. So I know when to move on and uh, when to wait. Uh, no, if the polygon's not appearing, it might be because um, hang on. it might be because it's hidden. If you go on, if you hover, don't click, hover over geometry imports, you might need to tick the box. So if you see a buy on ticket, it goes, and um, if, if I tick it, it comes. So you might need to just uh, tick the box to make sure it's it's there if you can't see the polygon. Uh, in terms of saving, um, what you need to do is if you go on one of these green lines, just add a space on one of them, and then you should be able to see the save button. If you press the drop down there, you press save as, it will then uh, give you uh, uh, an option to name your file, and then you'll be able to press save. I'm going to press cancel, but you need to press OK. <laughs> Okay, I can see the poll results and majority seem to be great and okay, we've got a couple of uh, not so good. Um, so hopefully you've now all managed to, to save it now that I've uh, re-shown that. So um, what I'll do is I'll head back to the PowerPoint. So you should be looking at one of these three now. And uh, what we're using today is, I'll talk to you a bit about satellites. So we're using uh, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-2 is a European Space Agency satellite. So it's, um, it's part of the Copernicus project. And this is an old poster, sorry, it's actually seven years uh, since it's been uh, protecting our planet. So um, there's two Sentinel um, satellites, the Sentinel-A and Sentinel-B and they, um, work. Uh, there are op opposite ends of, of the Earth, so they have um, opposite orbits, and that means that they can um, cover the Earth's uh, surface. So depending on where you are, so if you're at the equator or in the poles, um, it has uh, varying coverage. Um, so between um, between five and uh, 16 days uh, or for one satellite, or if you're considering both, then it's uh, between uh, two and eight day coverage. Um, yeah, so uh, the this project was uh, the mission of this project was to um, monitor crop yield, water pollution for disaster mapping, and uh, various other uh, monitoring environmental change. So exactly what we're doing today. So in the second step, uh, we're going to open an image, uh, open a Sentinel two image, and uh, I'll, pop that up. I'll leave this up for now. So um, if you um, if you all uh, look on the Sway booklet, you'll see there's a step two and there's lots of instructions on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys, uh, let's say, about five minutes to have a go and then I'll start demonstrating uh, what to do. And um, and so hopefully if, uh, if you, however far along you are, you'll be able to follow along with me. But I'll give you a chance first. Um, I always like to give people a chance to have a go uh, because uh, I think uh, coding is one of those things where it can take a lot of thought and uh, it's nice to figure out what you're doing. So I'll, I'll give you I'll give you about uh, about uh, five minutes to have a go before I start uh, start talking again and demonstrating. But let us know in the chat or you can turn your mic on if you have any questions.
I always take silence as everyone's working hard and uh, trying to get it done. So, but if you do have any questions, let us know in the chat. Okay, uh, you, can, you guys keep going. I'm just going to talk to you while, while you're going. So if you are having, um, um, I don't know anything, just a few tips. So remember to use semicolon at the end of the line. Um, so this section should all be on one line. So it's one statement. Um, use an underscore instead of a space uh, to separate words, especially like variable names. And uh, remember JavaScript is case sensitive. So um, those capitals and uh, small letters uh, do make a difference. So check those. And um, you can use two forward slashes if you wanna add any comments or notes in your code. So make sure every bracket that opens also closes and check uh, commas and full stops and things like that. So, um, what I'm going to do is I am going to start talking through uh, this section. Um, let me just get the booklet back so I can see the instructions too. Instructions up on the screen. So um, we should be uh, going for um, one line of code. So we've got our variable. Uh, so I'm, you can name yours whatever you like. I do recommend uh, keeping a uh, little notepad or um, a little um, a little um, um, piece of paper or something with uh, your variable names on it. So we will have about eight, eight to 10. So you just write down what it is and maybe variable name one or a little description of what it is. So in this case, it's image one. So you can call it what you like, maybe image one or call it call it the date, data set one, uh, anything, um, anything you'd like that means something to you. So it can be anything random. Um, it can be, um, It can be a cat, fish, dog, anything, anything that uh, that works for you. 
that um, it's better if it's something that actually has uh, has significance. So um, I'm zoomed in a bit, so if you can see it. So I'm going to call my uh, data set desk, short for December. So I notice I use the underscore to create a space there. Um, and then uh, the that we should have uh, copied and pasted is our ee dot um, image collection and uh, so that's uh, that's the name of our data set. So you can see that Google Earth Engine helps you along a little bit by uh, putting the brackets and the other end of the speech marks for you. So like I say, just make sure. You don't have uh, too many opening or too many closing. So next, uh, we're going to make uh, we're going to filter the bounds of our um, data set uh, by the geometry, which is the um, the polygon that's um, just down there. And, sorry, bear with me one second. And. Then uh, we're going to filter it uh, by the date. So every um, every option has a different date. So don't copy this date. Make sure you check uh, in the workbook uh, the date for your um, for your option. So uh, so I've made sure that in um, in each of these. Uh, dates um, that there's only uh, only one image um, not two that should be a comma sorry that, not concentrating um, yeah so there's only one image in that so um, there, sh there, there shouldn't be uh, more than more than one in that gap um, so map uh, function spell so at this point um, we're saying uh, We'd like to map the image and um, want it to return an image clipped to our geometry. geometry. And then make sure all our brackets are there and a semicolon. So what we can do at this point, just to check if we've got any typos, nothing should happen. Uh, if we press run, absolutely nothing should happen uh, visibly. Um, uh, if, some, if you do have a typo or an error, you should get something in red out in your console if you press run, which is up here. So hopefully you will have a, a long line that looks a bit like mine. Um, and that is uh, step two complete. So uh, I see there's some things going on in the chat about the order. So it's fine if you've done it in a different order. So it's pretty my fault that I've, put it, I've done it in a different order here to, uh, to what's in the booklet. So as long as uh, the bits in bracket match the, ma match the bit in front. So um, we can filter the date first, or we can filter the bounds, or we can, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which way around, which round we do it as long as the, the bits and brackets uh, match. So if we said filter bounds and then put the dates, that wouldn't work. But as long as we put filter date and then put the date. So I hope that uh, that clears that up. It will do exactly the same. So what that's done in the background, in the background, it's got that image ready or any images it could find uh, between between those dates and uh, in that polygon. And um, what uh, what we want to do next is actually display that image uh, in our map object down here. So that's what we're going to do uh, in the next step. So to be able to do that, uh, we need to pick our bands and um, we need to um, uh, choose our display parameters. So I'm going to show you uh, something quite quickly. Um, so here is just uh, an Excel spreadsheet, which um, it's quite funky. So um, what we have when we talk about bands is we have this idea that um, images are made of bands of data. So we've got this red, green, blue uh, repeating pattern going on here. And if we think about these maybe as pixels, um, so we've got different numbers in each of them. And if we look, uh, say over here, we've got 194, which is uh, quite a bright, uh, a bright color. 
And then over here, we've got 127, which is still green, but it's a slightly duller version of green. And you can see that pattern, hopefully, if I zoom in a bit more, across, across here. So we've got the duller, darker one. So I think that even says like 75, so it's, it's pretty dull. And then the brighter ones are 124. So we've got those which we consider our reflectance values, and uh, they determine the brightness of a pixel. And then we've got these bands of uh, data with red, green, blue. So if I start to zoom out, you should start to see some shadows and uh, sort of shapes starting to form. So if I continue zooming, you should hopefully start to see me. So uh, that's sort of how, uh, how images are put together with uh, pixels and bands. So in order to create a true color image, we need uh, the red, green and blue bands and those in Sentinel-2 data are bands four, three and two. So those are the bands that we're gonna be uh, drawing out to create a true color image. Um, so that's, that's what we'll be doing in, um, in step three. So um, hopefully by the end of step three, you should all be able to create a true color image, which should look like one of these. So if you're looking in the ocean, you might not see too much, uh, a little tiny bit of cloud and maybe a ship or two, but on the land, you should be able to see there's a bit of an urban area um, in the wildfire area and uh, I'm going to pick out some water bodies and some forest. And uh, in the agriculture land, you might be able to pick up crop circles and uh, farmland, and uh, maybe uh, maybe you might be able to pick up some buildings. There's also actually a solar farm somewhere in that image. So um, have a look and uh, have a go at, at script section three. Uh, again, I'll give you about uh, five minutes, and then I'll start demonstrating. As before, please let us know if you have any questions or queries. Uh, no question is too small here to help, and uh, we'd rather you understood it than uh, sat there being unsure. So please let us know. Can, Kim, can you tell us what your error says? Yeah, or you can just copy and paste uh, what's there and we can have a look. Yeah, that might be easier. Uh, okay, so a syntax error means uh, there's uh, some punctuation out of place. So there might be a dot or a comma or um, an uh, apostrophe or you know, speech mark, something like that uh, missing uh, from your line. So if you, yeah, okay, so you copy and pasted it. Let me have a look. Okay, so you can't put brackets in the uh, variable name. So um, if you take the brackets out from around uh, from around agriculture and the colon as well. So a, a col colon and brackets have significance in um, in, in JavaScript. So your, your variable name should only be made up of letters and underscores. Uh, 
Um, so if you uh, give that a go, and it doesn't matter if you use uh, single or double speech marks in JavaScript, they're uh, swappable, interchangeable, they have, the, they have the same significance. So um, you're good there. Um, and uh, you also don't need e e uh, dot filter dot date. It should just be uh, dot fil filter date with no with no dots there. Um, a bit like how your filter bounds is. So uh, give give those changes a go and then hit run and let's see where you're at. Uh, if your out gear is purple, it's probably because uh, your polygon is still on it. So if I just uh, show you. So uh, if you hover over geometry imports and untick your um, uh, your polygon, you'll, it will probably enable you to see your true color image uh, a bit better without the purple filter on the top. Perfect, great. I'll give you uh, another 30 seconds or so before I start talking and demonstrating again, just to make sure. Okay, so I'm gonna start this section. Um, so we'll start with the, the bands that we want uh, displayed. So again, we, we've got a variable. So we go with var. Um, I'm gonna call them uh, TC uh, bands, um, just because that's logical to me, true color bands. Um, but you might wanna call them desired bands or just bands or, image bands, any, anything that makes sense to you. But uh, like I said before, make, maybe make a note that this is a uh, variable name too. And then we want square brackets uh, this time. And uh, we're going for band four and band three and band two. It doesn't matter what order you put these in. Uh, you could do two, three, four, three, two, four, and any, anything uh, as long as you're picking out the correct bands. Again, we end our statement with a semicolon. And then uh, we want to put, um, sorry, I'm just seeing there's more things in. Okay, I'll come back to errors. I'll continue demonstrating this. And then uh, uh, Danielle, if you can help in the chat, uh, if you can. And um, if not, then I'll come back to, to it um, after I've demonstrated this section because might answer any errors that come up. So. Um, then we want to um, we want to uh, define our display um, parameters. So we we've got. But I'm going to call it display again. Call it what makes sense to you. You might call it display params or parameters or something like that or anything you like as long as it makes sense to you. And then we've got curly bracket. So you, again, you don't have to have spaces between, like I've put a space between the equals and the bracket. I just do that for readability because I prefer it, but uh, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. You can, um, you can not have spaces uh, if you prefer. So we've got, we're selecting our bands. So we're going for true color bands, which is the variable uh, I made above and uh, going for minimum of uh, zero and um, a maximum of 3000 and uh, again any semicolon so that, just to explain the um, minimum maximum so uh, in satellite imagery we get um, 
anything below zero, uh, so we get minus numbers, uh, bad data or no data, or um, all reflectance should be should be uh, above zero. And a maximum of three thousand. We don't expect reflectance to be to be nearly that high, but it's just to be inclusive, so we don't miss any uh, pixels of data. Okay. Um, so then uh, we want to add uh, this to our um, actual map object here. And we would do that, we talk directly to the map. So we say map, map has a capital M and add layer. And we're adding um, our initial data set. So our variable name one, and we're defining the display parameters and then we're giving it a name. So I'm going to call mine um, S2 image December. Uh, so we'll use it again. And then a semicolon at the end. And now if I hit run, let's see. Okay, I've got a layer error. I spelled Copernicus wrong. Have I spelled Copernicus wrong? I have. It's an E. <laughs> Tells me right for not copying pasting. <laughs> okay, so there you go. If we hover over the layers manager, we should be able to see our image name there, which is this bit here, the third item uh, that we named it. It appears there, and we can turn the layer on and off as as we like. And so yeah, okay. Um, I'll have a look at the chat now. But Daniela, can we get the poll up to see uh, how everyone found that section, if that's okay? So uh, I can see we've got one saying uh, mine doesn't run. Uh, did uh, did the demonstration help at all, or is it still still not running? And if it's not running, can you tell us what the error is in the console? That'd be really helpful. So can you can you tell us what the actual error says? Because uh, then we'll be able to know what the what the issue is. Um, what it what it says in the console in red. Okay, so you just need to check your variable names there and make sure you've put the correct variables in uh, at that point. So um, making sure that it's your it's this variable that's your uh, your second line there, the one that's got the display parameters with the bands and uh, the min and max, make sure that's your middle variable there that you've listed. Because um, that sort of error comes up when you've not got a display or a parameter variable listed and it's a data variable instead. And there was another, I don't understand the last sentence map. Uh, so um, what this what this statement does is um, so map is uh, so this 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 bit here is instructing this map object here to visualize all of the things that we've just set up here. So we want our data set, which so our uh, satellite data, which is this variable up here for these dates in this region. So we're telling it that's what we want, and then the second item is telling it. Uh, the display um, display parameters that we want. So we want these three bands that we identified before, the red, the green, the blue, 
and then we want the pixel values to be above zero. And we want the pixel values above zero because anything below zero is a missing data point or bad data. And um, so that that's what, and then this last item is naming our layer. So when we go in the layers manager, we've got the name of our layer over here. So we know what it is when we add more layers. So I hope that makes a bit more sense. Um, just gonna see. Um, I'm conscious of time and it'd be nice to get through a bit more of the workshop. Daniela, can you keep helping Anna in the chat and I'll crack on if that's okay. Um, just from the poll, it looks like most people are, are happy with it. So um, yeah, I think that's probably the best, uh, the best way to, to move forward. Um, so yeah, you should all be looking at, at one of these. And uh, so step four now is uh, opening the second image. So we're going to repeat the code uh, for different dates. So um, I'm thinking the workshop's going to finish at eight. So I might uh, I might actually just uh, demonstrate how to do it and you can follow along. Um, the, the Sway booklet is, um, is yours. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't remove access or anything. So you can, can keep working through afterwards and you're welcome to email us or contact us with any question. So if I, um, if I demonstrate, then um, hopefully we'll, um, yeah, we'll be able to get through some and you'll have, um, you'll have a chance to, to do it, to continue afterwards as well. So um, what we wanna do is we wanna repeat this for a second image. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy and paste that line, but I'm gonna rename it. So um, I'm gonna call this variable July and I'm gonna change the dates. And um, so for, uh, for this option three, for the Sargassum one, uh, it's, July, so 07, 05, 06, and everything else uh, stays the same. We've, we've got the same data set, different dates, and a different variable name to distinguish. So you could, I'm just going to add a couple of lines so we know this is the second image. Okay. And then I'm going to also add this to the map. So we've got our map add layer line again. So this time we want we want a data set two. So uh, whatever you've chosen uh, to name it, uh, we want the same display variable that we want to change our layer name so we can distinguish. So we've got uh, I'm going to call this one the same thing, but uh, July. And then not forgetting our semicolon at the end. And if we run that, we should, hopefully, when it loads. Yeah, it's drawing them. Perfect. Zoom in a little bit. Yeah, we've got our two images appearing there. So we don't need to repeat these two lines, these the, the bands and the display, because these two lines are they're variables that we can reuse again because the bands that we want and uh, the display parameters don't change um, for the second image. So uh, I'll keep demonstrating. I'll just uh, keep going with it so you, so you can uh, see, see where we get to. Um, so I think that was the end of uh, step four. So uh, if I uh, continue with step five, uh, what we're doing is we're doing the NDVI calculation now. And um, this is a function, so it means that we can um, use it again for our second image. So um, we're calling our function add NDVI, and uh, the way it works is um, it adds a band, a bit like how we have band uh, four, three, and two, it adds that to our images, so we get a band of NDVI. And that's our change detection band. So if we remember, that's the one that will give us the ratio from and give each pixel a value from minus one to one. So um, we want there's a pre um, um, 
pre-done command in um, or module in uh, JavaScript called normalize difference, which calculates the NDVI for us. So we don't have to type out the the um, the calculation. Uh, so and band four. So uh, the the order uh, does matter on this one. So we want the near infrared band first, and then the red band uh, written second. And um, then uh, we want to name this NDVI. And then uh, we can end that. And then what we want it to do is we want it to return an image and we want it to add NDVI band to our image. And then uh, we just need to close the function like so. So I can't spell return. Um, so you can see I've got that little red cross there, which uh, instantly tells me there's uh, something going on. Um, and it closed the bracket for me, which I didn't see. So um, that's just a function. I've not actually applied it to any image yet. And what I'm going to do next is, um, is apply it to an image. So um, I'm going to call this uh, December NDVI. Um, I'll put it in small, actually. Um, and we want it to add the function that we've made, so I'm pointing my finger, that we made up here. So we're saying add NDVI. And uh, then, uh, well, next we need to choose our color palette. Uh, so I'm going to create a variable uh, with uh, some colors in it. Um, just going to, uh, this is this is all explained in, in the workshop booklet. So um, we've got, uh, if you remember, I was talking about how uh, JavaScript was developed. It came from uh, internet based uh, scripts so um and i said css was uh, used to add color and uh fonts and things so hex colors are uh, derived from css and um so i'm just gonna put a bunch in but there are actual links to um in the booklet where you can see the different color palettes and choose a real color palette yeah there's six letters there and I'm just gonna choose a few. You can choose as many as you like. Um, there's there's sort of no limit to how many colors uh, if you'd like to include. Um, but I do recommend uh, putting putting more than five in this case, just so we can um, see, uh, I don't know what this is gonna look like. I'm just putting on the colors there <laughs> just for now. Um, uh, just to demonstrate. Um, so yeah, I'll leave that there as it is. And then I'm gonna add that to the map. Um, so similar to before, when we add um, add these to our layers. So I wanna add, uh, oh, I put dev instead of December. Uh, so I wanna put data set, um, December NDVI. And I want to select, um, select the NDVI band. So if you, if you remember in the function, we named that band NDVI. So the name of the function is add NDVI and the name of the band that it adds, adds is NDVI. So over here, we wanna add that band. Um, and then we want to uh, specify our colors. So palette, uh, the NDVI palette, I um, made just the line above and then the name of uh, the layer. So I'm gonna call it December NDVI. And then I need to close that. So same as the add layer above, we've got our data set, but this time we've selected the specific band we want to present. We've got our display parameters. So in this case, it's colors and um, we've got our layer name. So if I run that, add bands that should be add bands with an s 
again. Yeah, it's drawing our layers. So the colours I chose were absolutely not good colours. <laughs> yeah, not contrasting colours at all. So um, uh, I'll show you the the one from uh, the PowerPoint. Um, so what we should get, so this is actually seven, I did this with 17 different shades of, uh, of green uh, over here. So what you should get is for each of the years when you apply the NDVI is um, a range of, um, yeah, a range of colors. So um, you can see sort of greenness uh, visually um, here. So we've got our dark green bits, which are, you know, agriculture and our light green, which are, it's not, or if we think of this in NDVI values, our values closer to one are dark green and our uh, values uh, zero and below are these lighter patches. And uh, in the case of the ocean one, we can see the stream of uh, windrow of the algae uh, along there. So um, that's sort of what we're, what we're aiming, what we're aiming for. And um, like I say, I'm uh, sorry, we've seemed to have uh, run out of time uh, today. Uh, and, um, but uh, you can, like I say, you can keep working through the booklets and we are happy to help. Uh, so you can drop us an email and uh, we will happily help you or uh, a message on Twitter or something. The last part is uh, creating histograms because those images are um, not so not so easy to quantify. You can sort of visually interpret where the green has changed, uh, but this gives us a frequency of the of the different values of the outputs of the NDVI, so we can more uh, more easily quantify the change. Um, beyond this workshop, uh, we've had a little scour of the internet and found there are lots of uh, free resources out there. Uh, so here's some, they're also in your booklet, so uh, don't worry uh, about following this uh, too much, but they are at the end of your booklet for some other resources. So you can get JavaScript specific ones, or you can get Google Earth Engine uh, tutorials, which are online. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of free stuff out there. So uh, um, yeah, don't um, uh, don't worry, don't, don't, there's no need to pay for, for any, uh, any help with this. Um, I've just seen uh, Daniela's method, and um, there are um, there is a full code at the end of your workshop booklet for each of the options. So if you're unsure or uh, would like to use it as a reference, uh, they're there. And um, just uh, as part of our close, uh, it'd be really help helpful to us uh, to see uh, what you learnt today, and. Um, just uh, thinking, thinking about uh, going forward on uh, on your journey of uh, learning about environmental change. Um, just just to mention, more than maps uh, is a um, is a pro pro we're a global project. We've got partners uh, in Jamaica, Barbados, Australia, and uh, in the UK, and we have lots of different workshops and. Um, we try to show a balance that, um, for example, the work I do, so this mapping, if we think back to that disastrous management cycle, is uh, great to um, um, it, it's, it's, it's great to tell us where, where the change is and what the change is, but it doesn't necessarily help us uh, to manage the change or uh, create policy around it. So we have uh, other workshops on uh, stakeholder analysis and uh, other management aspects of environmental change. So um, please do keep an eye out for those if you're interested. Um, we are at More Than Maps on uh, Twitter. And um, yeah, please, uh, please do uh, give your feedback. I'll see if I can get that uh, word cloud up actually to... Yeah, we've got we've got results coming in, which is amazing. Thanks, guys. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is I might um, I might leave the word cloud up there. So please do keep your answers coming in. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass you on to Sam now for some closing remarks.